What do you get when you cross a Barnes with a Ewing? A boy or a girl? Barbecue wraps up what was intended to be the end of a miniseries, but the Ewing barbecue became a running theme every season, almost to the point of being a holiday episode. It's an episode that epitomizes the most tragic Shakespearean elements of the series and pushes all of the characters to the brink. Bobby returns from an invigorating morning run in his 1970s shorts and finds Jock and Tilly the caterer prepping for the annual Ewing barbecue. A local tradition held at South Fork. Been catering Ewing parties 12 years, Mr. Bobby. Ain't nobody never gone hungry yet. The character of Tilly comes off as a bit cringy at first, but they had the good fortune to cast the amazing character actress Irma P. Hall, who steals every scene with her charismatic performance. It's still appropriate to cringe. I'm just saying that Hall is a great actress and it's fun to watch her. Chalk is apoplectic to find out that Digger Barnes has been invited to the barbecue, but Bobby kindly tells him to grow up and bury the hatchet. Digger is also grumpy about the whole reunion, and he's getting back up from Cliff and doofus Barnes' cousin Jimmy. We get a recap of how Jock screwed Digger out of the oil fortune they discovered together, and we get a new little nugget. Digger was sweet on Ellie before Jock muscled him aside. Lucy is keen to meet cousin Jimmy, but Pam tells her that she might be a little bit too advanced for him. That's... kinda gross. More on that in a minute. I learned a riddle today. Ah, right, let's hear it. What do you get when you cross a Barnes with a Ewing? All right, what are the two possible answers? A boy or a girl? That's a really cute baby reveal. The couple is elated, and the barbecue becomes a bit of a low-key celebration of the pregnancy. JR, only one episode removed from having his infidelities exposed, continues to hit on random women at the barbecue. This does not go unnoticed by Sue Ellen, nor Lucy. Did uh, Bobby hire you? No, JR. Ah. Uh, <laughs> oh, JR. He never misses a trick. <laughs> Lucy also sets out to inform people about Pam's pregnancy, but only the people who will be most injured by it. Well, I am talking about your little brother Bobby, the apple of Jock Ewan's eye, and his wife and their marriage. Their bountiful marriage. I think I really undersold Lucy as a character the first few times I watched this show. She definitely functions as the puck of the Ewings, mischievously needling the adults wherever she can, and Charlene Tilton's performance gets a lot better over the course of the season. Lucy tries to make a connection with Cousin Jimmy, but it fizzles when he turns out to be a typical 19-year-old. What do you do for fun? Pool. Swimming pool? Shooting pool. Have you ever had a girlfriend that you've... you know... You know what? Never mind. Or at least that's the way it seems at first. More on that in a minute, too. Ellie and Digger reunite and reminisce as good friends in a nice moment. And it's nice to revisit the theme of what could have been that was set up in episode 3. Now, there's no doubt that Jock and Ellie love each other, but it's also clear that there was a marriage of circumstances with both families controlling large parts of the Dallas economy. To some extent, this mirrors the relationship between J.R. and Sue Ellen the tycoon and the beauty queen. Only Bobby seems to have married purely out of love, and, of course, everyone in the family reacts in horror at his choices. Next we get one of my favorite country-fried Shakespearean scenes. Shakespeare was fond of having bit players who were not integral to the plot discuss the proceedings as a way of dumping exposition and context on the audience. This narrative device has seemingly gone extinct in the highly visual mediums of television and cinema, but it's nice to see it on display here with Tilly and Sam. So loud. Dick Bonds is here. Say what? She's on the net. Dickens girl. Now that's news. News of Pamela's pregnancy drives Sue Ellen to the bottle, and she confronts J.R. about his lack of interest in her. There is nothing in this world that Jock Ewan wants more than a grandson. And I haven't been able to give him his first because of your disinterest in me. Digger and Jock agree to set aside their rivalry for the good of the grandchild, but Digger is still resentful, and Jock is still the arrogant alpha who loves to humiliate him. I decided right up there on that porch that I was going to forgive you. Forgive? 
Forgive me for what? I put that claim in my name to keep them from gambling his half away. How can he stand himself? Been a loser every day of his life. Couldn't even kill me the time he tried. Digger joins Sue Ellen and JR at the bottom of the bottle, but since he doesn't have a line between Tipsy and Blackout, he winds up drunkenly making a fool of himself in front of the party. Sue Ellen and JR don't fare much better as Sue Ellen drunkenly spills the details of her loveless marriage to the Dallas Ladies Auxiliary, and JR takes a knuckle sandwich from Bobby for calling Pam a whore. Good for you, Bobby. We find that the advice that Pamela gave to Cousin Jimmy actually worked because Lucy hates cool guys. So he and Lucy head off to the barn for a literal roll in the hay. Unfortunately, they're interrupted when Pam tells Jimmy to take Digger home. Pam stays behind in the loft to be away from it all, when a drunken JR staggers up to her and tries to paw at her in a clumsy sort of apology. Pam pulls away and a shocking tragedy ensues. Pamela is okay, but she loses the baby. Bobby is not sure that they will ever be able to have children, and he's determined to leave South Fork. But Jock comes as close to begging as he ever will by asking Pam to help him keep his family together. It's a genuinely soft moment and a rarity from Jock Ewing. I want to keep my family together. I don't want to lose another son. Outside, JR is recovering with a coffee, or more likely whiskey in a coffee cup, and Sue Ellen presses him on whether he pushed Pamela on purpose to end the pregnancy. Did you push her? I did not. JR looks her in the eye and gives her a non-contracted denial, which doesn't mean anything out of context, but in communication and deception studies, a non-contracted denial is a red flag for possibly lying, as is overly demonstrable eye contact. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Of course, we know JR didn't push her, but we aren't quite sure if he intended it to happen until... Are you sorry that she lost the baby? Wow. And with that, we know exactly what JR is capable of right as the credits roll. This ends the initial Ewing arc, and the conclusion is set up to be both open-ended and satisfying, depending on whether or not the series offer was extended. First, a word on why I'm doing this and why I call this series Shakespeare in a Ten Gallon Hat. William Shakespeare is, without a doubt, the most studied English language playwright this side of Chaucer, and with good reason. His plays provide insight into the culture and society of his times, but they also give an idea of the basic elements of humanity. Passion, jealousy, anger, betrayal, and above all, love. 400 years later, the things that fascinate us about the humanities haven't changed. We haven't changed, at least not fundamentally. Our villages have been replaced with cities, our daggers with pistols, and our kings and queens with politicians, tycoons, and celebrities. Regardless of whether a man wakes up under a bridge or in a palatial estate, he will go about his day feeling loss and envy and anger, and if he's lucky, connection. Jock Ewing sums it up perfectly at the end of the season, telling Pamela, We've had things our way so long that maybe, well, maybe it got in the way of our being just people. The family spends most of its time perched between their insatiable thirst for power and their love for one another. Two things that often come into conflict. That conflict is the catalyst for the show. So briefly, I'd like to look forward by looking back at the Ewings. Who they are, where they started, where they're going. Jock, the proud patriarch struggling to preserve the past. Ellie, the kind but pragmatic mother who wants nothing more than family unity. Bobby, the Henry V of the group, a playboy who is trying to make good. Pamela, the strong-willed princess out of place. Lucy, the orphan scamp, seeking love wherever she can find it, who loves to pull the wings off of flies. Sue Ellen, a crumbling Lady Macbeth looking for strength. And of course, J.R., the Iago-esque viper desperate to earn his daddy's love and compensate for his lack of traditional masculinity. All of them unique, deep, and thoughtful characters with lives of their own. There is so much more to come, but what's here has already reinvented the genre and would propel America's vision of capitalism and industry through the next decade. Well, that's it for now. 
I'm going to take a break for a few weeks, but I will be back for season two.